Okay, I'm going to get us started. So welcome everyone to the third webinar in this webinar series looking at advanced therapies in rare diseases. So this session is on market access and patient delivery in advanced therapies. Just going to start off with a little bit of housekeeping. So today we're using Zoom webinar. Um, if you are having any technical issues, please um, pop them in the chat box um, and also use that to introduce yourself. So hello to your fellow uh, participants or to the speakers. Um, and we also have a Q&A box. Um, so if you do have questions, um, please try and pop them in the Q&A box just in case we lose them in the chat. There will be time for questions after each presentation and then at the end of the session as well. And if you do need subtitles, you can enable those in Zoom. Um, you can do them just at the bottom of your screen there. We can turn them on or turn them off. And please do remember um, in the Q&A, you can um, put the thumbs up for questions that you like um, and we can get these answered first as well. So that's just a fun feature there too. So I'm just going to start with a little bit about Beacon, um, just for those who are new in the room. Um, so we are a UK based rare disease charity with a vision of no rare journey alone and a mission of building a united rare disease community of patient groups at its heart. So we all know the challenges the rare disease um, community faces in getting a diagnosis, accessing treatment and the impact um, that having or caring with someone with a rare disease can have on employment, education, mental health, all of these things. Um, Beacon, uh, we exist to help relieve some of this burden. Um, we support patient groups, no matter their size or their aims, um, and we upskill them so they're able to best support their community. And how do we do this? So our work kind of falls into three main areas. So we have patient group training, uh, where we support patient groups to form, grow and professionalize. Uh, and we empower patient groups to provide emotional and practical support to their communities. We also have uh, rare research where we help patient groups find a place at the heart of research. And we work to build a rare disease community where we facilitate connections and collaborations across the whole space. And just to move on to today's topic and this the topic of this webinar series. Um, so why are we looking at advanced therapies? Um, they're definitely something that's being talked about more and more, um, but what actually are they and are they relevant to you? Um, so the aim of this series is to provide a gateway of understanding that is targeted at patient group audience and to help individual patient groups to better understand whether advanced therapies may be a viable route to treatment for them. We also want to bring together a range of expertise and voices to provide a useful overview. And I'm just going to pass on to um, my CEO, Rick, who's going to talk a little bit about this webinar in the context of that. Thank you very much, Hannah. And hello, everybody. Really nice to be here today. I hope you can hear me nice and clearly. Um, yeah, so today's session really is hopefully on this simple topic about access to advanced therapies. Um, now, for those of you that attended the rest of the series, uh, you've probably got an understanding and appreciation now, at least, that advanced therapies are really quite complex scientifically, trying to do quite exciting things with science, and that makes it quite hard to push the development forward. Uh, but it's, it's really fair to say that a successful clinical trial proving this can impact and have efficacy in your patient population is still a long way from the final hurdle to get this drug accessible to patients. Uh, the complexity of actually making these therapies, uh, distributing them and administering to the patients is really high. Um, actually ensuring you have and improving you have that successful incorporation of uh, the new therapy itself, whether that's genetic material or whatever into the host cells can be quite challenging. And, you know, there's also uncertainty around the genetic duration of the effect of these treatments. And all of these different variables do create additional challenges when it comes to actually securing access to the therapy itself. And that's what we're gonna try and touch on in today's webinar. Really what this kind of boils down to is that regulation, reimbursement and patient delivery are all really complex challenges to patient access in the advanced therapy field. And we're gonna try in today's webinar and touch on each of these three areas, which is uh, no small feat as they are particularly complex across the spectrum. So yeah, through today, what we're hoping to touch on is the steps and processes that are involved in getting that gene therapy to market. Are there specific considerations you need to think about when you're going to regulators to try and get the approvals you need based on clinical trial results and what major things you want to consider? We want to look at the steps and processes and then involved in getting a gene therapy reimbursed. 
unsurprisingly, these kind of treatments are often very expensive and this creates different barriers to access that need to be negotiated and potentially even different models to actually pay for these type of treatments, especially when there is such high potential value. Uh, if you're talking about very long term benefits to the patient. Uh, we want to look at the challenges that are encountered when trying to deliver the approved product uh, to the patient community itself, which can go right from the production uh, of the gene therapy to the distribution to actually the place where it's administered. And, and we're going to really dive into that through looking at a case study that shows how these challenges have been overcome in a specific gene therapy uh, on the market today. Uh, so to do this fantastic work, we have two different speakers joining us today, and I'm really pleased to welcome them both. So first, we have Sarah Neubert, who's joining us from uh, Costello Medical. She's a senior analyst who works extensively and has done a lot of work uh, previously on gene therapies. And she'll be taking us through some of those reimbursement and regulation challenges, that perspective on access for the first talk. Following that, we're joined by Stefano uh, Zancan, who's head of clinical development at the Telephone Foundation. And Stefano is going to take us through his experience uh, in actually this, this case study in delivering uh, an approved reimbursed therapy uh, to the patients themselves and, and how they've had to go about setting up a very bespoke project to, to make that successful. So hopefully, you know, we can see how these two pieces fit together to give us that full picture of what access really means when we're diving into the advanced therapy space. Uh, so with that, I will, I'll leave it. I'm very pleased to, to welcome uh, Sarah to the stage. Uh, Sarah, I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation and uh, thank you for joining us. Great, thanks so much, Rick, for that introduction. Let me um, share my slides. All right, great. Can I just confirm that that's coming through? All good on this side, thank you, so much. Awesome. Um, all right, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining. I'm really excited to speak with you today about regulatory and access challenges for advanced therapies. Um, so the objectives um, for my discussion today are to understand the steps involved in companies getting a license to sell a therapy. Um, this is also kind of under the umbrella of regulation and then also securing payment for the therapy so that patients can access it, which is under the um, umbrella of reimbursement. Um, we'll also explore the challenges associated with both regulation and reimbursement and understand how these challenges are mitigated, mitigated and accounted for in practice. So an overview of my session um, will be just an introduction to advanced therapies. Um, this was part of the previous um, webinar in the series. So we'll just quickly be recapping that as a refresher. Um, and then we'll go through the steps of regulation, key governing bodies, concepts, and the processes. And then we'll go through the same for reimbursement. And then we'll go through two case studies um, that kind of demonstrate some of the challenges and variability that go along with regulation and reimbursement of advanced therapies. So as was mentioned during my introduction, I work for Costello Medical um, and just a brief overview about us. We're a consulting agency that provides scientific support in the analysis, interpretation and communication of clinical and health economic de data. And that includes um, supporting several advanced in gene therapies um, throughout their product life cycle. All right, so I will get started with that introduction to advanced therapies. Again, this might be a bit of a recap from what was in the previous webinar in this series, um, but hopefully it will just be a good refresher. So advanced um, therapy medicinal products, ATMPs, are novel therapies for human use based on genes, tissues, or cells. Um, and their primary aim is to restore or establish, um, quote, uh, normal or healthy function. Uh, these products have several distinctive features. Um, the first is their potential to cure or provide sustained improvement for patients rather than just being symptomatic treatments. Um, they generally have a very high price tag due to the cost of development and manufacturing, especially because a lot of these processes are um, in their infancy in terms of efficiency and um, having stable processes that lower costs. And finally, many of these um, Many of these therapies are a one-time administration, which is different than therapies that have to be taken chronically for um, chronic conditions. Great, so advanced therapies can be delivered in two ways, um, in vivo and ex vivo. Um, so in vivo therapy involves delivering genetic material directly, either through an IV or to a, a specific organ. Um, for example, if it's a treatment for the eye, it can be delivered directly to the eye or um, for the heart directly to the heart rather than being put into circulation um, in the blood. 
In contrast, ex vivo therapy works by removing specific cells from a person, genetically altering them in a laboratory, um, and transplanting them back into the person. And the approach taking depends on the specific disease, what the goals of treatment are, um, and what the uh, design of the therapy is. So there are three um, key types of advanced therapies in the UK and European Union. Uh, just to note that often advanced therapies are used for the treatment of rare diseases or conditions. Um, and in this case, the advanced therapies are considered to be orphan medicines. And we'll go through some of the special considerations um, for orphan medicines as we uh, continue throughout the regulation and reimbursement process. So the first is gene therapy medicines, um, which contain genetic material that is inserted into the cell of a patient. Um, again, this can be done in vivo or ex vivo, so delivered directly um, to the patient, or um, the cells can be taken out, reprogrammed, and then put back into the patient. Um, there's also somatic cell therapy medicines, which contain cells or tissues that have been manipulated to change their original biological characteristics and then tissue engineered medicines, um, which contain cells or tissues that have been modified to repair, regenerate, or replace human tissue. Um, and just to link the previous slide, um, as I mentioned, gene therapy can be in vivo or ex vivo. Somatic cell therapy and tissue engineered medicines um, are typically ex vivo. Um, and here's just uh, kind of another summary of the three different types of therapy. Um, so in gene therapy, it's the insertion of genes into the body to correct defective genes. Um, and then somatic cell therapy, um, you can see they're being taken out of the patient, processed in a laboratory, and then put back in. Um, and it's a similar process for tissue to engineered medicines, um, although they are meant to um, be regenerative once in the body um, and regenerate or restore tissue to normal function, as mentioned. All right. Um, so as of 2022, there were 178 ongoing advanced therapy trials in the UK, which suggests that there will be an upcoming boom of advanced therapies in the market. Um, so you can see the majority of these have been gene therapies, but there are also tissue engineered therapy and somatic cell therapies that are in development, um, and that it's a pretty even split between ex vivo and in vivo therapies. Um, so we're definitely entering um, a, a, an era of cell and gene therapies. So there are three, um, after the research and clinical development process, there are three overarching steps of getting advanced therapies to patients. So the first is regulation. Uh, that's essentially getting permission to put the advanced therapy on the market based on data that demonstrates that it's uh, safe and that it works well to uh, reach its aim of hopefully alleviating the symptoms of a disease or possibly curing it. Um, for example, in the UK, the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency is the one that gives this permission. The next step is reimbursement. So although the advanced therapy might have been approved for use in patients, it's likely too expensive for patients to pay for out of pocket. As we mentioned, these are really high cost therapies. So governments or private insurers, um, depending on the uh, healthcare structure of the country, will decide if the advanced therapy is quote, worth paying for on behalf of patients. And so um, we'll discuss what goes into that consideration and um, how they define what is worth paying for um, because it's a pretty standardized process. And then the last step is patient access. Um, and I'll just be covering the first two steps in my talk and then um, the second part of this webinar will be on patient access. Great, so um, starting with regulation, how do advanced therapies become available for patients? So to get an advanced therapy on the market, developers submit an application for what's called marketing authorization to the appropriate governing body, um, which depends on where they want the therapy to be available. So often multiple submissions for marketing authorization have to be made. Um, so in the United States, this, states this organization is the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. Um, in the European Union, it's the EMA. Um, there's also the Committee for Advanced Therapies and the Committee for Medicinal Products for Human Use. Um, and then in the UK, 
it is the um, MHRA, which we mentioned previously. Um, and following Brexit, the MHRA is the UK standalone regulator, whereas um, there used to be used to be the EMA and the MHRA. Um, and the marketing authorization applications have different names depending on the country as well. So in the USA, the application you submit is called a new drug application or an NDA, whereas in the European Union and UK, it's a uh, marketing authorization application. So there are um, several challenges involved with um, getting ATMPs approved for use, um, mostly due to the novel nature of these therapies. So the, the first is um, evolving regulatory standards. Um, fewer target patients um, so mean it might take longer to collect um, sufficient robust data. Um, there also might be a yeah, there might be a lack of current treatments to compare the advanced therapy with. So whereas um, uh, a, a trial that's being run for a more common disease that already has a, a clear standard of care, um, there might not be a clear standard of care for some of these conditions that are being targeted for advanced therapy use. And then more data may be required for diseases with complex subgroups. So again, this kind of um, compounds the challenges of having fewer target patients. Um, many of these conditions also have um, really specific subgroups that have specific needs and even possibly specific um, genetic causes for the disease, um, which might mean that the patient population, given how heterogeneous it is, um, needs to be, studies need to be run separately depending on the subgroups. Overall, advanced therapies have a relatively higher degree of uncertainty compared to other treatments, um, primarily because of their novelty. They haven't been around that long. Um, and so the establishment of a new committee, um, the CAT, which we discussed uh, previously for the EMA, brings together experts in the field to evaluate the marketing authorization applications. Um, yeah, and so that's what we're gonna talk about in the next slide. So yeah, many of the potential solutions um, involve asking for scientific advice from the governing bodies that are responsible for making these regulatory decisions. Um, and in 2022, the EMA launched that pilot to offer support for developers of advanced therapies. Um, and this service includes sharing best practice principles for manufacturing advanced therapies supporting with planning clinical development that meets regulatory standards, providing scientific advice for data collection to inform future, future marketing authorization, and providing a fee waiver for developers working on orphan medicines um, as an incentive for them to continue working on them. And patient groups can participate in regulatory decisions by providing a patient perspective to the risks and benefits of therapies. Um, so specifically the MHRA, which as we mentioned before is the UK's regulatory decision-making body, has a patient group um, consultative forum that's open to people with an interest in medicines and medical devices and to patient groups who can represent the views of their members um, and feed into these discussions. Um, so yeah, that covers topics that these sessions can cover include patient attitudes to the risk and benefit um, profile of a medicine, which is especially important for these therapies, which are, yes, potentially life-changing, but also, um, you know, run the risk of not being effective in the long term, or then also um, potentially having some safety concerns in the long term, given that we just don't have long-term data on most of them. Great. Um, so that covers um, regulatory processes. Um, so now we can move on to reimbursement. So once an advanced therapy is approved, how is it going to be paid for? Um, so as we've mentioned a couple of times now, they often have a really high price tag. So governments or private insurers will decide if they should pay for advanced therapy. Um, they would basically be paying the developer on behalf of patients. Um, and so that is evaluated through a health technology assessment. Again, this varies depending on the country where it's taking place. So in the United States, there's no national program for health technology assessments. Um, each individual insurer um, and even um, like 
federally funded insurance, Medicare and Medicaid have individual processes for determining what should go on their formulary, which is basically the list of drugs that they will reimburse. Um, and that process is really not transparent. So um, that's a particular hurdle in the United States. Um, the European Union has the European Commission, but most country, all countries within the European Union usually have their own um, HTA body. And in the United Kingdom, this is NICE, um, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Um, and this is the, the body that will do the health technology assessment for all medicines, not just advanced therapies. So there are several uh, criteria considered in health technology assessments. So the first is what is the impact of the targeted disease on individuals and societies? Um, in other words, like how much of an unmet need is there? Um, like for example, if there's no therapy available for a certain condition, um, it might have a greater impact on patients, um, societies, the patient community um, than one that has several treatment options that are all safe, effective, and affordable. Um, how serious is the targeted, targeted disease? How much better is the advanced therapy when compared to current treatments that are available? Um, and that's measured in terms of how well it works and how safe it is, and how cost-effective the ATMP is. And we'll go through um, what cost-effective means because it's actually a very specific definition. Um, and then a final consideration is just if there are any other ethical, social, and or patient aspects that should be considered, um, like patient-centric aspects, that is. So, for example, a potential social issue is unequal access to advanced therapies, which I think we'll get into in more detail in the, the second portion of this webinar. Um, but essentially, if advanced therapies are only delivered in large academic centers, which they often are, as that's where research is taking place, and um, they might have the funds to um, purchase the, the delivery systems for these advanced therapies. Um, these academic hospitals tend to be in more urban areas, so some populations may be less likely to receive the advanced therapy. So that would be a, a social uh, issue, basically, that HTAs would consider. Um, so now we're going to get into um, how cost effectiveness is evaluated. So all costs and benefits associated with each treatment need to be considered and quantified to estimate the overall cost effectiveness of the advanced therapy versus existing treatments, um, also considered comparators in this case, um, for the targeted disease. So these costs could be the cost of hospital um, visits, hospital stays, um, general practitioner appointments, tests, treatment for any side effects. Um, so really when these assessments take place, there's a holistic look of all of the costs that are incurred for treatment of the disease. Um, and a term that we'll see a couple times is quality adjusted life years, um, which are used to quantify the length of life and quality of life into a single um, figure, like a single number. Um, and that, yeah, takes into account the benefits. So for example, if um, the amount of, I guess, like decreement that um, patients experience in their quality of life, like how much the um, living with this condition lowers their quality of life um, is measured alongside um, how much a treatment that would extend their life, like how long it would extend it. So um, this is expressed in terms of what's called an ICER, um, also known as an incremental cost effectiveness ratio, which is equal to the difference in cost between two treatments divided by the difference in their effect on quality of life. So we have a little figure here. So um, you would basically be subtracting the cost of the comparator from the cost of the advanced therapy um, and dividing that over um, the uh, amount of qualities that a comparator treatment provides to a patient um, from the amount of qualities that the advanced therapy would um, supply to the patient. Um, so the ratio essentially describes the average cost associated with an additional unit of health effect. 
Um, and this ratio is the maximum amount a decision maker is willing to pay for a unit of um, health outcome. And again, that unit of health outcome is um, like qualities gained. So not only the amount that the medicine would extend life, but also how much it would impact the quality of life of the patients taking that medicine. Um, so if the ICER, like this ratio um, that's on the right here, is uh, less than the threshold that a government determines, um, then they'll likely reimburse the new therapy. So each um, governing body, each HTA body, determines what their threshold is um, for this ratio and anything under that they will pay for. So this ICER can be used within a cost utility analysis. Um, and yeah, that's essentially what this is called. Um, it's like a cost effectiveness, cost utility analysis. It's called a cost utility analysis when you specifically um, are integrating qualities into it. Um, yeah, Appreciate that can be kind of a um, confusing concept, especially because you're quantifying, you know, all of the effect of this medicine, this like potentially transformative medicine um, into one number. So again, that's what a lot of the challenges we'll discuss. That's where they come from um, because it's easier to do this for some traditional med medicinal therapies, but much more difficult for advanced therapies. So yeah, as we mentioned, the ICER essentially answers the question, what is the average cost associated with an additional unit of health effect, which presumably for medicines is always health benefit. Um, and as I mentioned, each um, HTA body has a threshold, um, which is like the maximum amount they're willing to pay for a unit of health effect. Um, and so NICE's uh, cost effectiveness threshold is 20 to 30,000 pounds per quality gained. But for um, orphan medicines, which we mentioned many um, advanced therapies are targeting orphan diseases, um, it's much higher. So it's 100,000 to 300,000 per quality. Okay. Um, so as we can see, that's already kind of a complicated concept. And then there are a lot of additional challenges to getting advanced therapies paid for. So um, first, often there's no or limited current treatments to directly compare the advanced therapy with. Um, so that's difficult to run randomized controlled trials, which is the gold standard for evaluating information uh, interventions. And therefore it's difficult to get that information about exactly how much the advanced therapy is improving the quality of life of patients. There's also a lack of long-term data about how well the advanced therapy works and how safe it is, which um, also feeds into the uh, regulatory challenges mentioned previously. Um, there's just a lot of uncertainty around these advanced therapies. There's also ethical considerations about denying patients a potential cure while evidence development is undergoing. So as we mentioned, it can be difficult to run these really robust, um, really valid randomized control trials for rare diseases and advanced therapies. And given that it's a one-time administration, um, the expectation of that is that there is a long-term effect and no long-term safety concerns, or that's the goal. But obviously, it's impossible to truly know that without um, running really long-term trials. So um, there are ethical considerations about should we pr be providing these um, advanced therapies that are potential cures, even though there is uncertainty about the duration of effect and the safety. Um, not only is this a concern for patients who obviously um, want to be completely safe when being administered their therapy, but it's also a consideration for um, regulatory decision makers and reimbursement decision makers who have a limited budget. So there is impact um, to the rest of the health system if so much money is being poured into paying for these advanced therapies when it's unclear if they will actually work. So a couple more, um, this feeds into it as well. Um, advanced therapies are really expensive, reaching pr price points in the millions of pounds. So although health systems may be able to pay the associated costs now, as more advanced therapies are developed um, and submitted for reimbursement, it might be harder to budget. Um, just as we previously mentioned, it's not 
Um, there aren't unlimited funds. So using funds for advanced therapies that are really high cost is taking away from um, the funds for other disease areas, which is a really difficult decision. Um, different countries also have different reimbursement standards. So research has found that European and Canadian HTA bodies recommend access to fewer therapies than US health plans when there's limited evidence and high scientific uncertainty. So some uh, countries and some specific health plans are more capable or willing um, to take that risk. Um, also, just in general, um, current health technology assessment analyses are not necessarily well suited for advanced therapies overall, given they just that that standard ICER ratio doesn't necessarily take into account again all of those points about duration of effect, um, long term uncertainty, and really high costs. Great. So. Um, we do have um, some positives now, some potential solutions for these reimbursement challenges. Um, so covering kind of all three of these points, ensuring efficient collection of high quality real world evidence is super important. So real world evidence is data collected outside of clinical research settings, um, typically in observational non-interventional studies. Often this can be looking through like an insurance claims database in the um, United States specifically. Um, and the collection of this data allows for advanced therapies to be used earlier as um, developers do not have to wait for a long-term randomized control trial to be run. Um, they can use real world data as it's being collected to continue to prove the um, safety and efficacy of their treatment. Um, especially when there's no treatments readily available for comparison where you can't run a randomized control trial with two different treatment arms, real world evidence can shed light on how um, existing standard of care works in real clinical practice um, and what patients with the condition are actually using. And it can even be used to create like synthetic treatment arms um, or indirect treatment comparisons, um, which allow for comparison without running a randomized trial with two arms. Great, so um, to solve the problem of advanced therapies being expensive, um, many countries and uh, HTA bodies have used managed entry agreements, which are agreements between the developer and a payer or provider that enables the patient to access the therapy uh, subject to specific conditions. So if the, for example, if the um, government uh, in the UK let's say the NHS uh, just paid for the entire advanced therapy, they would be taking on pretty much all of the risk of it not working in the long term. But using these managed entry agreements places some of the risk back on the manufacturer, um, basically saying if this doesn't work as advertised, um, the government will not pay for all of the therapy and the manufacturer will have to supplement that. So. These can be both finance-based agreements, um, which we'll go into in more detail, um, but they address concerns about the therapy's budget impact um, or performance-based agreements, which address concerns about the therapy's clinical value and specifically clinical value in the long-term after a one-time one administration. Okay, great. Um, so, Again, as we mentioned, H current HTA analyses are not well suited for advanced therapies overall. So um, there are currently several initiatives to try to um, create new um, systems or new pathways for analyses for advanced therapies. Um, and most of them can are considering the value advan of advanced therapies as a whole in appraisals. So there's also educational and societal benefits beyond benefits directly to the patient. So that includes things like the value of hope, um, alleviating caregiver burden, um, the lifetime burden of illness, and also just uh, scientific value. So these are potentially transformative therapies and um, reimbursing them and seeing how they work in real clinical practice will lead to improvement of them and more data about what's working and what isn't, um, which can lead to the development of even more effective gene therapies in the future. Um, 
Additionally, things like non-adherence. So if there's a prescribed treatment regimen where patients have to take a treatment every day, um, obviously they won't have to do that if there's a one-time administration. So that's something um, that should be taken into account. Um, and yeah, just in, in general, providing a more holistic view. Um, so that includes including multiple stakeholders when assessing the value of an advanced therapy. Um, so not only healthcare professionals that treat uh, patients with said diseases, but also patient groups can contribute to these discussions. Um, they can provide statements, they can um, attend the HTA appraisal sessions and provide their perspective on what the value of such a therapy would be for them. So appreciate, I wanna to get to the case studies and these can be kind of getting in the weeds, but I'll just do a um, per quick overview of performance-based agreements. Um, so one example is conditional treatment continuation. So by definition, um, payment of advanced therapy developers is dependent on whether the advanced therapy meets pre-specified short-term treatment goals that are laid out at the time of um, setting up this agreement. So the benefit is that it reduces the risk of the um, reimbursement decision making overpaying upfront and also addresses uncertainty and long term outcomes because data continues to be collected. Um, and the risks are that there's a risk of poor data collection and there's also a risk to the manufacturer that it won't meet the pre specified short term treatment goal and they will have to um, supplement and pay for the therapy. Um, and then another example is population level coverage with evidence development. And so this is where advanced therapies continue collecting data for a certain amount of time about the advanced therapy's safety and efficacy, or otherwise known as how well it works, after which the governing body makes the final reimbursement decision. And the benefit here is that this addresses the uncertainty and long-term outcomes because, again, data continues to be collected. Um, but there is a risk of long study times. Um, and yeah, it's basically just delaying the decision. Um, and by continuing to run the study, you're being able to treat more patients, but um, yeah, that could go on for a long time before the HTA body determines that it's a sufficient amount of information. Um, so these slides will be shared um, after in case you'd like to review these types of agreements in more depth, but I, I won't go into them now. Great, so um, just to move on, we're gonna go over two brief case studies. The first is CAR-T therapies. So a CAR-T therapy um, is a chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy, um, and they were granted marketing authorization by the European Commission in 2018 for specific blood cancers. CAR-T therapies target an individual's immune response, otherwise you might've heard of it referred to as immunotherapy. And essentially the patient's uh, immune cells are collected and reprogrammed to target their cancer more specifically. In 2019, two CAR-T therapies obtained reimbursement in five major European markets, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the UK. And you can see they achieved reimbursement um, at slightly variable cost, but generally um, the same cost. However, each of these countries took a different approach to reimbursement challenges. So in France, there were annual reassessments based on longer term data. So they didn't necessarily say, OK, we're going to reimburse this forever. We won't reconsider if we're going to reimburse it for 10 to 15 years. They were keeping a close eye on the long term data and continually assessing it every year. And they also established a specific CAR-T registry to collect such data. Um, in Germany, the, they use original outcomes-based reimbursement. So uh, Novartis, which is the developer of the CAR-T therapy, partially reimbursed costs if a patient died as a result of their blood cancer within an agreed time frame. In other words, if the therapy did not work, Novartis partially reimbursed the cost um, rather than putting that all on the government reimbursement agency. And just as a note, this reimbursement strategy historically had not been used in Germany, so it was un unprecedented. Italy used a staggered payment scheme where payments were made in installments um, as long as the agreed upon outcomes were achieved and then also sustained. So that was in three installments and otherwise the manufacturer would have to cover that reimbursement. 
A similar strategy was taken um, in Spain, although as you can see, they used two installments. And then in the UK, NICE recommended CAR-T therapies for inclusion in Cancer Drugs Fund, which allows for their use in the NHS while further data are collected to support the cost effectiveness appraisal and then their final recommendation. So again, it was kind of contingent on longer term outcomes. So this case study demonstrates the import importance of adopting novel approaches to pricing and reimbursement because it's not going to be a one size fit all solution at this stage, um, but the main uh, principles of all of these different approaches to the reimbursement challenges are the continued data collection in the form of real world evidence, for example, the use of registries, um, the use of long term studies. Um, the use of conditional reimbursement strategies. So realistically, the uh, reimbursement bodies are not going to take the entire load of these costs um, and it will need to be, the risk will need to be shared with the manufacturer. Um, and then after licensing, patients can have a role in pharmacovigilance so they can share side effects or adverse reactions to help with evaluating the therapy after the studies that are actively collecting adverse events and looking for side effects um, have been over. So sometimes in those real world settings, um, when you're just looking at a claims database, for example, um, you might not really be understanding that patient experience in the way that you are when a clinical study is being run. So that's a, a great place where uh, patient groups can have a, have a role in providing that long-term data and sharing the impact of uh, the therapy on their lives. And then just this one will be um, a little more brief, but uh, we also want to go through a case study of a ther gene therapy called Zintegla. Is that coming through? Okay, great. Um, so Zintegla is a gene therapy for beta thalassemia, which is a rare blood disorder with the potential for high morbidity and mortality. And the therapy was approved by the EMA and the FDA. So again, the, the European and US um, regulatory agencies, but was sub subsequently withdrawn from the German market following failed pricing negotiations. So the manufacturer Bluebird Bio they failed to achieve reimbursement in Germany and the UK. And when they made that announcement, they declared that the reimbursement system in uh, Europe was quote, broken um, because they the HTA assessments just were not um, in their eyes equipped to capture the full value of the therapy. However, that was in August of 2021. And in July of 2022, ICER published a report that Zintegla is cost effective at a cost of $2.1 million. Um, however, it was still pending FDA approval at that time. Um, so yeah, essentially this, oh, also, sorry, I should mention this is confusing. ICER um, is the name of that ratio we talked about earlier, but it's also an independent clinical and economic review group. Um, that's based in the U.S. because the U.S. does not have one national governing body for reimbursement processes. ICER is a, a bit like a watchdog um, that is gaining more and more uh, prominence in the U.S. to try to um, level out drug prices. So this case study uh, demonstrates that commercial success is not guaranteed necessarily following approval. Um, and so it's really important to be considering the, not only just the regulation, but also the reimbursement, because that's a key part of patient access. You can prove that it's safe and effective, but if you're not willing to um, engage with payers and develop those novel reimbursement solutions, patients still may not be able to get access to the therapy. All right, um, and just as a quick summary um, and to go over the role of patient groups, um, we covered regulation, which are the steps for getting an advanced therapy approved for use in patients, and then reimbursement, um, so making the advanced therapy affordable for patients by having governments and private insurers pay for it. Again, um, inevitably with advanced therapies, this is going to fall on the manufacturer as well, um, and there, I predict in the coming years will be a lot of developments around the HTA processes and how they're looking at advanced therapies, especially with the upcoming boom and how many are set to come to market. And then finally, the rest of this webinar will go over um, patient access. So you have that to look forward to.
Um, and there, again, there are several challenges that arise in the first two steps because of the novel nature of advanced therapies, but they can uh, be addressed through using a more holistic process um, and being innovative when looking at new approaches to pricing and reimbursement. And patient groups can help in both reg regulatory and reimbursement decision making by providing a patient perspective of the risks and benefits of advanced therapies and creating political momentum for the regulation and reimbursement of advanced therapies. So for example, um, just as there would be with any other therapy, um, there are uh, patient groups that are involved in the appraisal of advanced therapies. And so, especially when there's limited data and challenges with collecting data, it's super important to have um, the patient perspective and patient voice heard during these appraisals. Um, and yeah, the specific example we mentioned is that they can um, help with evidence collection after the advanced therapy has been approved um, when we're beyond that uh, clinical trial stage by reporting side effects as they happen um, and also reporting the impact of the therapy on their lives or lives of people that they know um, or other members of their patient groups or maybe it's a caregiver reporting the impact um, of the life of their child. Great, um, that concludes my presentation. I know I'm um, just about at time, but uh, any questions? Or we can maybe save them for the end. Hi, thank you so much for that, Sarah. Um, that was a really great presentation and a great overview of what is a really complex topic. And it was um, really good to hear about where patient groups can get involved as well. Um, that's really relevant to um, everyone here. I think I'm just gonna ask one quick question before we um, go over to Stefano's um, presentation. Um, so we have this one in the chat and it's, what do you think is the most burdening red tape that needs improvement in order to speed up regulatory approval? Yeah, definitely. I think um, in terms of red tape, I'm not sure if this would be considered red tape, but I think those managed entry agreements are realistically it seemed to be um, the clearest path forward in terms of getting reimbursement for these advanced therapies. And often um, this takes a lot of negotiation between the reimbursement body and then also the manufacturer. And so I think um, kind of reforming that process. So that's discussed ahead of time and in advance of um, those final steps, just to make sure that patients can have access as soon as possible um, is really important or implementing strategies where even if all of the details of those agreements aren't ironed out, patients are um, able to get access and it's more of a discussion of sharing the risk of the high cost between the manufacturer and the reimbursement agency rather than um, putting that burden on the patient to have to wait for the potentially transformative therapy. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And I can see there are some more questions coming in, but we will try to get to those um, at the Q&A at the end. Um, but for now, I'd love to introduce um, Stefano. Sorry, Sarah, do you mind stop sharing your screen? Great, um, yeah, now happy to introduce Stefano, um, who will be talking about his work on the Just Flight Home project. Hi, thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I now share my screen. Okay, I, my presentation focuses on uh, the patient access to treatment and uh, to, to show you some experience with our program, just like home, and consideration that we took uh, on board. The first thing that uh, I would like to say is that the patient access doesn't resolve, as uh, uh, Sarah has uh, said, directly with the reimbursement, and, and even not with the agreement of the cost, because uh, especially for rare disease and uh, advanced therapy, there are other factors to be to take into account that I will show in, the, in my presentation. So let me introduce, first of all, who is, um, sorry, I try to close this, okay. Um, who is Fondazione Taito? Fondazione Taito is a non-profit organization whose mission is to find a cure for rare genetic disease. And uh, it focuses on uh, gene therapy in order to find this cure. We have two institutes, two research institutes, one in Milan, the SRTGET, and one in Pozzuoli near Naples uh, called TGEM. 
we have managed in these years to find a cure for two different disease. Uh, Stream Bell is now is on the market since 2016 for other skid. Lim MLD in 2020 uh, was granted a uh, uh, market authorization from, from EMA. Uh, in both occasions, these two projects came from our institute in Milano, were developed by us. We start the clinical phase uh, within the Fondation Teleton, and then were uh, passed to an industrial apartment who could run uh, the last mile toward the uh, marketing authorization application and through all the reimbursement process. We have so far treated 148 patients with a rare disease in gene therapy, both uh, ex vivo and in vivo gene therapy. Most of them in Milan, but you see there are uh, different uh, immunodeficiencies, disorder, metabolic disorder that we are treating. And here on the, on the right side, you see the, the, the number for each uh, specific disease. Patient comes from all over the world. And this is an important factor to consider. SRT jet, what it is, SRTG is a joint venture between Ospedale San Raffaele in Milano and Fondazione Teleton. It's dedicated to gene and cell therapy with a focus on genetic disease and uh, in attempt to develop new therapeutic strategy uh, in order to uh, evaluate them, their efficacy and safety in a clinical, in preclinical model first, and then to um, translate them in clinical application for different uh, disease. We have a clinical unit with a specific expertise for conducting clinical trials with uh, advanced therapy. The hospital is a large university hospital with multi-specialist centers with uh, several beds and scientists, but it is important for in this regard to, to, to mention that there is uh, a stem cell program for uh, stem cell transplant, both autologous and allogenic transplant, which is just accredited, accredited. And there is the pediatric immunomatology unit with, with a strong um, expertise in, uh, in clinical trials, as I said before, but also in different immune uh, disorder, hematological disorder, uh, and me metabolic disorders. This is the scheme for an, an ex vivo treatment, basically. The patient, before receiving the, the, the gene therapy, uh, has to, we have to collect cells from the, from the, from the patient through a pharesis or bone marrow harvest. The cells go to, to the lab, to the GMO uh, manufacturing um, site for uh, selection, transduction, and then are prepared the, the bias of a sac for, for infusion, while the patient in parallel um, conduct a, a myeloablative uh, treatment, conditioning treatment in order to create space for the new cells that will be reinfused uh, when the gene therapy is administered. After that, there, is, there are several follow-up visits to keep on monitoring the safety and efficacy of the treatment. There is, um, I'll try to move this, okay. Uh, so first consideration, that it should be what we have learned from what I show so far. Uh, if a complex or rare disease require high specialized treatment. And this concentration of knowledge and resource and expertise is not available in all countries. In particular, advanced therapy need certified healthcare, trained healthcare, certified center, uh, which again are not available in all in all countries. It, and this is even more important for uh, autologous for ex vivo gene therapy, where, as I, I showed you before in the first in the previous slides, the complexity of a, the cell withdrawal and uh, the conditioning regime and administration is quite complex. Patient remain in the hospital from 
the first evaluation for uh, their eligibility for gene therapy to when they can be discharged from the hospital, but still monitoring remain for about four or five months. And so the, 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 the main message here is that it's not also possible or, or thinkable to create, to establish a specialized center in every country. Uh, this block. Okay. So, what are the challenges? When we uh, uh, got uh, Stream Valley's approval of the market, this is the, 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 the happy ending story of this, of, this, uh, uh, of this project. And also, for, for the story time, it was important because finally we find a cure for a rare genetic disease. But, however, we also uh, brought additional responsibilities in order to take care of a patient and family that are coming to Milan to receive the, the gene therapy. As you see, patient comes from different parts of the world. So what does it mean access to therapy in concrete? It means to have the possibility to receive a treatment and to, to get this there must be a valid treatment. There must be an expert clinical site, an expert in both gene therapy and in the disease, and the treatment must be available. And how a treatment is available, when it is available treatment. In the course of uh, the clinical development through the marketing authorization application, marketing approval, and price agreement and reimbursement procedures, there are three moments when a treatment is available. It's available during a clinical trial in the clinical phase. It's available when it is approved, it is now a marketing therapy. And it's also available for uh, dedicated uh, program like compassionate use, hospitalization, what is generally called expanded access, that generally are allowed from the moment that the clinical development is closed, it's closed for recruitment till the moment that a, a drug is available on the market. So in this, uh, in this gap, in this period, the expanded assets can really uh, offer the possibility for a patient to receive a treatment. But is this enough? This is the question. We, we have said that patients with a rare disease are rare and why spread it around the world, array by definition, okay? And we have also said that clinical sites with this expert for advanced therapy and a rare disease are quite rare as well. So the consequence of that, it is, is that the patient has to travel to the clinical site. It's not more that the drug goes to the patient, but it's the patient that goes where the treatment is and where there is the clinical site where the treatment can be. Uh, administrative. So this implies that somebody has to take care of all the traveling, uh, logistic uh, problem, uh, obtaining passport, visa, resident permits, organizing transfer. We have to take care of a lodging, uh, of to solve language and cultural differences. The family has to consider a longer permanence abroad, so which is the impact on their job, on the school of their children, on their social life. And then we have to take care of all individual and family needs. And, and then, of course, costs are also to be considered. So this requires a holistic approach. In, uh, and I mean that is not only the treatment the evaluation of the safety and efficacy, the clinical ass assistance that is important, but also all the other aspects that allow a patient to receive a treatment. So the travel and logic, administrative and bureaucratic procedures, cultural mediator, caregiving, psychological support. And this is what Talenton wanted to, to create, to develop when Stream Valley was approved. And indeed, in 2016, the Just Like Home program uh, 
started with the first patient uh, um, supported in November 1960. And the, the, um, the program is still alive with a, a lot of sucks. You see that we have managed 148 patients so far. And we are keeping to take care of our patient because the, uh, the advanced therapy required a quite a long monitoring in terms of uh, to, 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 to check safety and, and, and efficacy. Uh, and so patients uh, keep on coming back uh, to, to our site to, be, to continue this follow-up uh, visits. What Just Like Home offer, which kind of support? So we try to, to offer the family the best possible experience while they are facing an important phase of their life which is the gene therapy. Uh, so we, we support them in a variety of ways from organization, logistic, legal, emotional, and cultural mediation. We provide housings and the support is all, always given on a case by case, try to evaluate the real family situation. Each family is different from, the, from another and may need different things. Overall, this support also increase compliance with the clinical program and the follow-up monitoring. This is roughly the, the, the structure of a, of a just like home with, uh, uh, you know, as I said, there are, uh, a core, a care coordinator, which is the main figures uh, coordinating everything with a, a secretary, a psychologist, cultural mediator, and a research nurse. And then there are other uh, figures uh, that are involved in the support, like interpreters, educators, professional caregiver, and cultural mediator. And then we can have also fundraising, volunteers, and service providers that can would help us on a case-by-case -case situation. The Just Like Home team, which is uh, the boxes are lighted in yellow, so apologize this is in Italia, but just to show you that the, 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 the group is uh, fully integrated in the clinical unit. On the, on the, on the left side of the, of the organigram, there are the, the clinician, uh, nurses, uh, and, and so on. On the right side, the, under the TCTO uh, group, there are all uh, clinical uh, experts in terms of giving support for uh, preparation of a protocol, regulatory submission, management of clinical studies, and management of an expanded access program. So everything must be quite every coordinated and integrated in order to properly uh, functions. This is again, the, 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 the same concept, basically the care coordinator, it is the, the core, of the, the, the main figure that interact directly with the family and coordinate all the other uh, roles involved in the, in the support. The same scheme, basically with secretary, psychological, cultural mediator, educators, caregiver, and volunteers can be um, transferred in any other side. For example, uh, sorry, this is the scheme that we have in place in, at, in, in Milan while this one is the scheme where we have implemented in Naples, where we have less studies, less patients. And so, so far, we have, uh, we have managed to um, provide the, the, the most critical support with cultural mediator, with, with uh, uh, provision of uh, uh, logistic support, with a clinical research news and a, and a local care coordinator, but still lack some of the of the support and benefits that we are giving in Milan. So let's try to summarize again and which are the consideration uh, for, for the patient. Okay, rare and ultra rare disease are, are, are very rare in, in a, as I said. And some countries in Europe, for example, may have very few patients affected, affected for a given disease. So Again, if we come back to the, the previous section, it doesn't make sense to have specialized center down there. So again, patients has to travel to the specialized clinical center. And such clinical centers now 
have to be prepared to welcome patients from abroad and offer the holistic approach that I showed you before. So in, in concrete, they, have, they must have a structure dedicated to patient management. And this is, could be a quite a new concept to be implemented in the clinical center. So again, the example of stream valleys. With stream valleys, again, we had, we said patient to travel, not the drug, but how, how this is feasible, how this is possible. We have to, we uh, analyze how to fund financial treatment costs and how to support the patient. So basically, we, we make a deep analysis of the current European uh, regulation uh, laws for uh, patient treatment abroad. And then we have the Just Like Home programs. So we have two main uh, laws. The Social Security Regulation, which is a regulation, so as such, apply to all European countries within the European Union. And we have a directive. And both of these uh, laws uh, rules the, the, the treatment abroad. However, the Social Security Regulation doesn't require any anticipation by the family. There is a pre-authorized form, the, the, what is called Form S2, which is must be prepared and obtained because the patient comes to, 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 the, the, to, the, to the country abroad for treatment. And this is prepared by, by, by local clinician, by referred clinician in the local country. While the director directly require the patient to pay in advance. Both of regulation cover only drug and treatment cost. They, no other cost is covered. But again, we decide to, to follow, to, 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 to use the, the social security regulation because this, as I said, is implemented in all European countries and doesn't require any anticipation money by the family. We have, we have here from, from Sarah and, and Nick that um, advanced therapy can be quite expensive. So it's really difficult to, to figure out that a family can afford to pay in advance the treatment. This is the reason why also, the reason why for which we decide to go to the social security regulation. What does just like home in terms of cost? We are not the possibility to cover hospitalization and treated cost. However, we can, on a case by case and exceptional circumstance, after in deep and careful evaluation of the family situation, provide support to the family in order to cover all, all or part of the logistic cost, which is not the standard but it's something that Fondazione Teneton does on a regular basis in, for some patient that doesn't have any other opportunity, doesn't have any other financial um, income to, to cover the logistic cost. So again, clinical and treatment costs are covered by as a due form for European patient, and no logistic co costs are covered. For most of a commercial patient or patient treated under expanded access, just like home program contributed in some extent, to some extent, to the travel and lodging cost or to any additional cost. Without just like home, some of these patients, even European patient could never be able to get access to the therapy. We need to, to solve, to facilitate the logistic barrier between the countries in order to give access to therapy. It is worth to mention that Turkey cover all treatment, all costs, treatment, clinical, and logistic costs. And this is a good example for a country. And that's why I would, recommend to establish a process to have travel logistics costs covered by the country of origin, not only, uh, not by the patient or by any other support like just a home that, can, uh, that a patient can 
uh, bevel lag to, 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 to find. Now, once again, let's uh, review the, the three different, you remember that I, uh, at the beginning, I mentioned the, the three different uh, chance to get access to, to a therapy, the clinical trial, the expanded access, and the commercial forms. For all of them, just like home staff provide support. I'm not speaking about financial support, but just support for logistic, uh, care coordinator, mediators, interpreter, psychological support. The support is given to all the patient coming. However, for the clinical trial, all the other costs, the drug, the treatment, the clinical cost, and the travel lodging are covered by the sponsor of the clinical trial. When we move to expanded access, the sponsor, the owner of the, of the, of the, of the, of the drug product can only give uh, the, the, the treatment for free of charge. While the clinical costs for an European patient are covered by the form as a dual per transborder um, process to, to, to cover expenses for uh, treatment abroad. But for extra European patient, the S2 does, doesn't exist. So there must be like for Turkey, the country of region that cover this cost or to, uh, to have private funds or the insurance. For commercial uh, treatment, the situation is even worse because even the treatment is not, uh, is not uh, free of charge. Uh, the treatment must be paid, of course. And so also for the treatment, there's two wards for European patients, but not for extra European patients, which again has to consider this, uh, this cost for, from private fund insurance, country origin, and whatever. So the situation moving from a clinical trial to a commercial situation is even worse for a patient if it doesn't have enough uh, support for the country of origin, for the regulation that is in place, or for insurance or whatever. So, uh, and here the situation is more, it is more uh, difficult for patients coming from extra European Union. We have, uh, uh, in our experience, we had uh, 73 patients uh, coming to, to Milan from extra European country. The majority of them came within a clinical trial, so all the costs were covered. But then we had uh, 12 patients for in expanded access and nine patients for commercial who came from, from uh, uh, extra Europe, and for which we what, what what happened? What happened? Luckily, seven had enough uh, personal fund or insurance coverage to cover uh, all the costs. In some cases, donors uh, appear and can provide uh, additional support. Uh, in some cases, uh, we manage to uh, I would say work, we, I said, just like go, managed to find a solution so that some of these patients could be, I say, recognized as an Italian patient and so uh, be uh, covered by the national health system. This, appear, this uh, occurred for two uh, Algerian um, siblings, which work in Italy and for two siblings in, uh, from Argentina who were recognized as Italian because their uh, grandparents had, uh, were Italians. Uh, in some cases, I would say Arabia and Turkey cover the, the, all the expenses, but in some cases there is also donation. Just like home tried also to, uh, to find uh, if, there is this possibility to, to, to apply for a grant, for a, for a donation. You know, there are some uh, regional government institutions that dedicate some of their budget to support patients that are coming to Italy to receive an athlete treatment. So we try to give us our help in identifying this possible uh, solution and to 
and to to work to, to do all the the paperwork uh, for this achievement which is however it is in any case quite rare and difficult to obtain so um as a summary, for most of the patients, just like home has contributed to some extent to travel and logistic cost. This, this occurs for both uh, European patients and side European patients. For extra European patients, we have worked to get fund or to strategy to, to have the coverage of, of, of the cost. Uh, but in, in, in any case, treatment costs are always outside just like home possibilities. And this as a consequence that extra European patient without the support of a country origin, insurance, personal fund or donation, we will not have access to a therapy. So the access to a therapy in lack of money for a commercial drug is still not possible. Let me add an additional consideration. Uh, we have a centralized approval procedures for uh, ATMP and rare disease. And we have different uh, uh, price and reimbursement procedures, uh, which are different in each, in each of the European country. However, there is uh, 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 um, the possibilities to have a joint procurement agreement that was used for to face uh, COVID-19 pandemic. In that case, in that situation, which was an emergency situation, uh, the European Union has some emergency procedures. One of these is this, the, the Joint Procurement Agreement, which uh, in some way negotiate the price for all European countries. And the price was the same for all European countries. And this would be something which I believe is extremely used for ATMPs and rare disease, because we would like a fast available treatment in European country, because for some uh, of the approved uh, treatment, they can be approved, they can be authorized in all Europe, but in practice, they can only be available in Germany or in Italy or UK, because the company has not yet uh, passed through all the reimbursement process. In addition, we would have the same price across Europe, avoiding useless competition and more clinical, clinical centers. So in order to, to conclude, I repeat some of the concepts that I already, already said, but the take home message, rare ultra rare disease are rare. And ATMPs and rare disease is a demanding combination. It needs specialized center, which are not, it is not feasible to establish in every country. This implies that the patients to travel to a specialized center. And this center must have a structure dedicated to patient management, to welcome patients coming from abroad. We should establish a process to have um, travel and logic costs, which are currently not covered by a stool are paid by the country of origin or, and not by the patient to find a sort of solution to this potential obstacle to a success to the therapy. Patient side European have even more difficulties to have access to a treatment because of a lack of a, of a, a as do procedures. And, and so to potential difficulty to find funds for treatment, clinical and logistic costs. And, and again, having a joint procurement agreement would really apply to, to, to rare disease, would really make life easier for, for patients. And thank you very much. If you have questions, here I am. Thanks so much, Stefano. Um, it sounds like the Just Like Home project is such a good program. And I thought it was really great to highlight that even when you have got a gene therapy reimbursed and approved, and if you've gone through those steps that Sarah highlighted, that's not the end of the journey. And there are different things you need to consider when going into, you know, how to actually get um, the treatment to patients. Um, so thank you so much about that. I'm just going to ask 
Sarah to come off camera as well, and I'm going to see if we can answer a few questions that we've got um, through in the Q&A. Um, and we do have a little bit more time, guys. So if you've got any other questions, please um, please do um, pop them in the Q&A tab and we'll try and get to them. So the first question I was going to ask um, that's come through earlier was, um, is there any sort of maximum that a patient can access? Um, is it only one time thing or multiple treatments that can be accessed? I'm assuming that just means the gene therapy is that the gene therapy is that. Yeah, typically, so that will depend on the therapy and then it will depend on, um, yeah, it will primarily depend on the therapy. So the idea of most gene therapies is that they're one-time therapies, one-time administration. Um, so if that didn't work um, the first time, if it didn't reach its efficacy endpoints, then likely um, the uh, healthcare provider would not like recommend uh, doing the administration again. Um, so yeah, I think that it would depend on the specific therapy, but likely won't be applicable since they're supposed to be one-time therapies. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you, Sarah. And then we had another question being, are reimbursement negotiations in each country not confidential? Yeah, they are. So the specific details, um, like the specific price is usually confidential, even like the specific ICER is usually confidential. So um, in my experience, specifically with NICE, uh, anything that's in the submission from the company to NICE can be marked as it's called commercial and confidence. Um, so if you ever see that, that just means that, yeah, it, it's essentially uh, private um, and the, the company doesn't want that to be shared. However, um, I, I should probably specify, so NICE is making a recommendation um, in the UK that by law, um, if, if that recommendation is made, then it does need to be implemented by the NHS and the, um, it does need to be implemented by the NHS and the therapy needs to be available to patients. I think it's usually within three months um, of the recommendation. However, the NHS is actually the one purchasing the drug from the manufacturer um, and then NHS is, is the, the purchaser and NICE is just a recommending body. Um, however, again, it is like law that the recommendations are carried through. So I don't know how much you would call it a recommendation really, um, but basically you can still, the NICE does publish whether they are recommending the drug under a managed entry agreement. Um, so, for example, I know um, Zolgensma, uh, which was a uh, gene therapy uh, accepted for SMA, um, that was um, accepted, but it was only recommended under a managed entry agreement. But to your point, the exact details of that managed entry agreement and the prices are kept confidential. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and I have another one. So how do you see the increasing number of gene therapies in the um, pipeline affecting the landscape for regulation, reimbursement and patient delivery in the next 10 years. I don't know, Stefan, if you have any thoughts on this one. I, I think that uh, potentially could affect the, the regulators in mm -hmm. order to facilitate some of the process that we have to, to the company has to pass through the, uh, the process to get the, the product approved, uh, develop test it, and then, then approve. In, 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 gene, in gene therapy, we have to, the, the, the ITIS cost are, uh, the ITIS are the production cost. So we have to find a way to, to reduce this cost. In, a, in, in US, there is an attempt, an attempt, an attempt by uh, NIH to, uh, to standardize the, um, the production process for uh, AVU-8 in order to uh, uh, we'll say, take advantage of what was done for a first compound and not to be replicated for a second compound. The same concept, we are trying to, to apply the same concept also in Fondazione Teleton for an ex vivo program. We have to consider that uh, uh, the treatment we are administrating consists of a vector, a production process, and a gene that inserting within the vector. But the vector and the process are exactly the same for all the different treatment that we are producing. What is simply changing, it is the, the gene that we are inserted in the vector. So in some way, we have to, to, to find a way 
to, uh, to maximize the, the knowledge that we have developed for a first compound and to use it for a second compound without replicating. This in the long term can reduce the cost and hopefully to reduce also the, the price of a, of, a, of, a, of a treatment, we hope. <laughs> Thanks, Stefano. I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Sarah? Yeah, I completely agree. I was going to mention that that um, the more therapies that are on the market, ideally the cost goes down because um, you don't have that cost of innovation, but it won't be immediate. Um, and there still are really high development costs for those products. Um, and the only other thing to mention is that right now, most of the therapies are targeting rare diseases as often um, rare diseases, for example, for gene therapies, um, they might be the result of a, a singular mutation that is identifiable and therefore is a target for gene therapy. Um, but as we potentially move towards advanced therapies um, that are for more to treat more common diseases. Um, that's also going to be a problem. So it's or it's going to be a problem for the budget uh, impact. Um, it obviously will be hopefully benefiting patients. But um, right now, like maybe health plans can afford to pay for three um, million dollar gene therapies because the patient population is really small. Um, but the conversation will become more difficult when those advanced therapies um, start to be approved for um, diseases that affect um, like hundreds of thousands, um, if not more people within the um, covered health plan. In addition, more uh, product in gene therapy, which also means more specialized centers in gene therapy and advanced therapy, which potentially this help uh, patient and prevent them to take a long journey to, to come to a specialized center. We just had a follow-up to the question on um, the reimbursements and the confidentiality point. So um, the, the, the question was because of the example in the um, CRT, the cost was given for the drug in different countries. Um, is that not the actual cost paid, but the recommended cost by the health technology assessment? That is a good question. Um, I can go back into the source to confirm exactly um, what it what it is, but it was under a given range. Um, so I think that that was, um, it's not necessarily the exact cost. Um, it's likely the recommended cost. Thanks, Sarah. And um, we've just got one more um, really quick question um, for Stefano. So is there an equivalent to um, Telethon in the UK? I don't know. Uh, certainly in UK, there are specialized centers that are used to receive a patient from, from a certain distance. I don't know from, from where exactly. And so in some way, uh, there should be something uh, within both clinical center that are dedicated to patient welcome and management. Um, I don't know if uh, this support include also a sort of financial support as uh, just like Comproma in some cases uh, offers. Okay, thanks guys. I'm, I, just, I think we are just about out of time, but I wanna say another massive thank you to Stefano and to Sarah for presenting today. Um, I thought they were really useful and helpful presentations on this topic. And I'm just gonna do a few really quick notices uh, just before I let everyone go. So as I mentioned, this is the third in our advanced therapy series. We have got one more uh, webinar coming up and that's in two weeks time on the 7th of June. This one is on managing expectations of advanced therapies. It's gonna be run as a panel session where we have experts from across the gene therapy space um, coming to talk about um, the landscape and also to answer any questions you might have. So if you didn't get your questions answered in this session, please do sign up and come to the next session because we're gonna really um, uh, get people to ask and answer everyone's questions because it's gonna be a more interactive session. So I really hope to see you there. And other than that, just a big thank you for tuning in and please do remember to fill out the feedback survey and you'll get that just um, after the end of the webinar here.
So thanks again, guys. And yeah, enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully see you in a couple of weeks at the next um, at the next event.